Observation. This is a great opportunity for slaughter. The day the power of love overrules the love of power, the world will know peace. This is a famous quote by Gandhi, which as we have discovered, didn't really mean anything, and Gandhi should have just stuck to being a lawyer. That's why today, I'm going to ask and answer a question, actually basically everybody has thought to themselves, can you beat StarCraft II Wings of Liberty as a genocidal monster? Now for the rules, every enemy dies. Every enemy structure, every enemy objective, and every enemy unit. The only exception to this will be unkillable units, with a few obvious examples like Kerrigan or the Hybrid that are just blatantly invincible, but there are a few more tedious and obscure examples, such as enemy structures and units that you can't get to. I like Zeratul, but until he learns how to jump over cliffs and how to stab air units, he isn't going to be able to do shit against these overseers. The game difficulty will be set on brutal the entire run, and that's about it. There's not a whole lot of clarification that needs to be done, and I'm not going to sit down and give you a 15 paragraph essay on what genocide means and its history. I'm just going to kill a lot of things. Starting off with Liberation Day, it's Liberation Day. I have to say going out of my way to kill a few hollowboards, a couple statues, and a handful of marines doesn't quite line up there with the hardest missions I've ever done. Don't get me wrong, it could have been the hardest mission in the game, those three vikings, oh, those were brutal. But with luck on my side and some Mario level micro, I was able to move on to the Outlaws. The Outlaws is also a mission with a pretty lax enemy count. I think the only units that aren't directly en route to the main objective are a few marines off to the side, and the marines that spawn out of this tunnel if you don't assist the rebel group. This mission is just incredibly straightforward, and plays basically the same way I would play through it in a standard Wings of Liberty run. And up to this point, I wouldn't blame you if you were thinking that this challenge would be a walk in the park. However, any semblance of a pleasant stroll gets utterly decimated with Zero Hour. This is probably the highest difficulty spike I've ever seen in a challenge run. What is normally a pretty casual mission, turns into a complete nightmare. Firstly, and most obviously, the Zerg have a bunch of bases that need to be destroyed, and you can't stall your offense. Over time the Zerg get more and more upgrades, while you're stuck with unupgraded marines and medics, so you need to get an early lead within the first few minutes. You also have to do all this in a strict time limit, while maintaining a solid defense at home so you can further reinforce your army. So far this is pretty stressful, but ultimately manageable. What makes this truly abominable is the last few minutes of the mission. The Nidus Worms are the hardest part because you have to have a good squadron of marines deployed by them, because for some reason I genuinely couldn't tell you, the Nidus Worms infinitely respawn. And no, you can't put buildings on top of them, or even marines on top of them. You have to kill them over and over and over again. Also, you have to have marines deployed all over the map, because the drop pods can drop everywhere on the map. Despite the Maru claim I made two minutes ago, I'm not going to pretend I'm a micro god, but this mission's time limit is so strict that I beat it in the literal last frame of the fade to black. Could I have done this better? More than likely, yeah, but by the time I beat it, I didn't care how elegant it was, I was just glad it was over. Just like most Wings of Liberty runs, my first upgrades are going to be the units in the microwave comp. In terms of the first plants I could go to, I wanted to do the evacuation first, since I wanted a few upgrades before I attempted smash and grab. At the very beginning of the mission, I made sure to get all the hidden mineral and Vespin caches before I reached my base, since most of the challenge in these missions is going to stem from the first few minutes of macro. For this same reason, I actually killed quite a few colonists at various points of the mission. I know this is extremely immoral, but I really appreciate the time that was freed up to me. What makes the difference between a bland, boring genocide and a fun, light-hearted genocide is how much innocent civilians die. This exact quote is going to be mentioned when Davies Over Party 2022 becomes a trending hashtag. Fortunately, unlike Zero Hour, there's almost no respawning units in this mission. As far as I could tell, the only respawning units are the Nidus Worms in the last few transports, and some Creep Tumors at the beginning of the mission. Once you kill a Hive, you're not going to see any Zerg from it. Once I had a balanced and diverse army comp destroy all the hives and creep tumors, 
All I had left to do was follow the transport vehicle one more time to beat the mission. Up next on Redstone, killing everything is not only a hidden feat of strength, but is actually a pretty easy way to beat the Devil's Playground. If you don't want to go through tedious Reaper Micro, just kill all the Zergs so the only threat your SCVs have to face is unpaid medical leave to the afterlife via incineration. Compared to the last two missions, the Zerg are actually pretty tame here. There's lots of wide stretches to spread out your marines, the hives are a lot less conjoined, and the units used are a lot less threatening. You can generally go in here with a few dozen marines and medics, and still emerge victorious. I know it's pretty unconventional, but if you struggle on this mission, this is a genuine strategy I'd highly recommend. After Redstone, I decided to do Infested before Smash and Grab, since I wanted to finish my marine and medic upgrades, and I wanted the last research for the Perdition turrets. Since the main objective is to kill every infested structure, as long as you beat the mission during the day, you pretty much just win. The only exception of this are a few decorative structures, and the two infestors that emerge only at night. As long as you kill those, you can just beat the mission the standard way. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to smash and grab. This was definitely one of my favorite missions in the entire run, if not my favorite. Originally, I was kind of dreading it, but it was actually really enjoyable. The scripting in particular is really good. The Zerg drop pods, for example, are entirely possible to remove as a threat. As far as I'm aware, there's only one scripted event where the Zerg descend by the last Protoss fortification. But even that's actually a huge benefit, because once this occurs, the Protoss don't make any more units, meaning you don't have to worry about the Protoss interrupting your Zerg slaughtering session. In terms of actually destroying the Zerg, you can pretty easily create a choke point near the Zerg entrance with some defensive structures, which gives you all the time in the world to rally an army. You don't really need a big one either, if you can focus fire the Banelings and wedge your army in between the Zerg structures, you can pretty easily kill anything the Zerg try to throw at you. Once you clear out the Zerg, you can basically do whatever you want, since the Protoss no longer send out attack waves, and this one base can sustain as many as 39 SCVs on minerals at the same time. I think the only base in the entire series that has more deposits is the one you start with in All In you can probably kill a few cannons and some stone zealots. After this we got the artifact, and moved on to Guns N' Roses. I had a debate with myself whether or not the altar seal should count as an enemy, but ended up agreeing that it should. This did spice up the mission a bit, since I had to be a lot more aggressive during the early game, and in the late game I couldn't get away with F2 and A moving the enemy base. Just like always, the hardest part of killing the Protoss base is getting up the main ramp. It's not as bad with Zerg, since most of their AoE units are melee, but with Protoss, you're just one storm away from having to load an old save. Once I finally got up the ramp and could spread my units out, very little that the Protoss could throw would actually do anything. However, I did notice something strange when I was tearing through the Protoss base. I couldn't help but think there were a few observers watching me, and sure enough, there are. I don't have ravens, science vessels, or orbital commands at this point, so what did I have to do? Well, when you destroy all the enemy structures, the mission automatically ends. So I kept one cannon alive, and with a newfound saturation from both of the Protoss bases, constructed a measly 67 missile tours across the entire map. You may think this was overkill, which it was. I don't think there was a single observer after the first four I killed, but I really wanted to make sure that I played the shittiest version of Bloom's tower defense known to man. After this I researched Ultra Capacitors, and moved on to Haven's Fall. I thought purifying the colony would be easier than protecting it, and let me tell you how wrong this was. Firstly, it wasn't even right. Protecting the colony would be infinitely easier, and this mission can be a complete pain in the ass without proper upgrades. Secondly, doing this meant I failed at basic addition, so by the time I got to Char, I had 24 Zerg research, which means I have to play through a mission that quite a few of you said would be pretty painful. And don't you worry, we'll get there. If I could go back in time and change two things, and throw myself onto the nearest train track, ending the space-time continuum as we know it. But if that wasn't an option, I would go back in time and tell myself how big of a fucking idiot I was, and tell myself to protect the damn colony. The worst part is I can't even say much about this. 
As long as you make sure there are no infested on the map when you clear the final settlement, you beat the mission. But I inadvertently fucked myself over so hard for no reason. So I finally beat this miserable pile of forsaken dread, unknowing of the consequences that laid ahead of me, and moved on to the dig. Remember how I said a minute ago that moving up Protoss ramps is pretty hard? Well here it is again. If I had to be honest though, I didn't struggle on this mission because of annoying mechanics or restrictions. The problem is I've never played the mission this way so I actually just sucked. This was the first time I got the Yippie Kaye achievement, much less kill everything for the level skip. I decided I wanted an army comp of siege tanks, vikings, and marines. Vikings to deal with the air units and colossi, siege tanks to support the vikings and deal with all the ground forces, and marines to deal with the mortals. The biggest issue with this mission was the resources, but once you clear out the top base, you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the mission. I also tried to beat the main objective while killing the last unit at the same time. Admittedly, I don't think it mattered, but I figured I'd try it because why not. After the dig, I wanted to go to New Folsom before playing through the Protoss campaign, since both of these missions would be fairly easy. For this, I sided with Tosh, since Ghost Inspectors don't really see too much of a place in this run, and Tosh's mission is way easier to beat with a genocide rule set. There's also not a whole lot to get into here. It's another mission where there's hardly any optional enemies, so as long as you make sure Raven didn't fly into an obscure corner off the map, and you clear both of the bonus objectives, you can just play through the mission like normal. After this, I decided on how I was going to handle Whispers of Doom. If you don't know, the first Prophecy missions under a genocide rule set is literally impossible for two main reasons. Firstly, there's about a billion flying units that spawn during scripted events that are only added in to add visual flair. Secondly, Kerrigan is just invincible in this segment. She can't be killed without cheats, and there's a bunch of infinitely respawning Zerg. I decided to play through this mission with a genocide rule set, but ignore all events where it's strictly impossible. This is one of the only missions that made me have to specify at the beginning about unkillable units. And since something similar happens in a main story, I decided to include this. I don't think anybody with 4 brain cells is going to be too upset that I'm not quitting a run because I can't kill something that is literally invincible, but I know I had to clarify this since it was going to inevitably be commented on. After Whispers of Dune is a sinister turn, which is trivialized by the existence of the Wings of Liberty Immortal. If you don't know what Hardened Shield is, it makes it so every attack against it that does more than 10 damage is reduced to 10 damage. Combine this with a high Templar for feedback, and the hybrid is never a problem. Once you get a handful of Immortals and high Templar, you can just spam Stalkers non-stop since the only units that can pose a threat are air units. Once you kill all the surrounding bases and units, all you have to do is right-click the chambers and beat the mission. Up next is Echoes of the Future, which you probably expected to be really easy, which is where you're absolutely wrong. If you didn't know that these Hive Clusters exist, I don't blame you, because there's absolutely no incentive to try and destroy them. And only one unit can get onto this platform without help, and that's the Stalker. Well, technically Zeratul too, but that's not always a good idea. The problem isn't as much that the Stalkers aren't good, in fact, they do a pretty good job at killing everything. The problem lies on getting them on the platform. Especially on the easternmost hive, trying to find a good location to blink my stalkers into took 30 minutes. Eventually I found a good location on the topmost part of the platform, where my colossi would support my forces, and my stalkers could blink into a good position. Once all the hives were destroyed, only one enemy remained, all the overlords patrolling the center of the map. Most of these were fairly standard kills, since they'd inevitably patrol close to an edge and get shot down by my stalkers, but this one wouldn't move an inch. The only way to damage this overlord was through Storm, so I had to spend minutes and minutes getting High Templar, getting them into position, and putting Storms down in a good enough location that the overlord would die before it would escape. Overall, a pretty tedious and claustrophobic experience I wouldn't recommend. After this, we move on to the Mobius Factor. I tried playing through it before the Zeratul missions, but I really wanted the Hercules before I moved on to it. And yes, I'm a very big advocate for the Hercules. 
I think it's a very underrated unit that deserves more love than it gets. Anyways, on the Mobius Factor, there's a big Zerg base on the bottom left, which isn't too difficult to destroy. Getting there is kind of tedious, but that's about it. There's also a bunch of crawlers and creep tumors on islands scattered across the outskirts of the map, which has to be the most baffling example of an unkillable unit yet. By this point in the game, you don't have any air units that can shoot down. So you're probably thinking, well, couldn't you just land your units on the islands? Well, yeah, you should be able to, but for whatever reason, you can't. This means that quite a few of these buildings are entirely unkillable. Some of them can be killed with siege tanks, but that's about it. This was by far the most difficult part of this mission. Finding out what locations you can and can't land on, and which of those locations can or can't be shot with siege tanks is baffling at best, mind-numbing at worst. Despite this tedium, I destroyed as much buildings as I possibly could, killed all the forces by Kerrigan, and moved on to Supernova. Luckily this was a mission you could play fairly standardly. Since the fire and flames will kill everything that stand in its wake, all you have to do is place in a mission as you normally would, but make sure the Protoss that were on the outskirts of the map were destroyed before you did the main objective. Outside of the last Protoss fortification, all you have to worry about here is the occasional observer, cannons, and a few warp prisms. With a unit comp of Vikings, Banshees, and Science Vessels, we have a pretty good counter to everything in the mission, kill everything, and move on to the Sigma Quadrant. Maw of the Void, just like always, is still just a massive pain in the ass. Do you like missions that last 28 years? I don't. I don't really like it at all, actually. Battle cruisers and science vessels would be the main units I used in this mission, which do a pretty good job at killing everything. Having Yamato cannon on a rapid fire hotkey made the mothership completely melt, and after that was dealt with, all I had to do was survey the map and ensure that no survivors remained. There are a few carriers on the outer reaches, a few buildings, but probably my favorite was this warp prism that wouldn't stop having a seizure in my base. I put him down with the Yamato cannon and moved out to destroy the vault. I was originally going to say that this doesn't force any spawns, but that isn't correct. My bullshittery had to be stopped. The Death Fleet would descend on my pitiful world. One entire warp prism. The worst part is this massive force actually worked. I had to go back and load to an old save, made sure I destroyed this massive army, beat the mission, and moved on to char- Oh fuck. I only have 24 Zerg research. Well fuck what missions are available. Oh god, no! No, 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 you can't make me do this. This wasn't a part of my fucking contract. God, I actually don't know how to beat this mission. Uh, who else is masochistic enough to try this? Okay, Grant, you beautiful bastard. Show me how I win. Alright, so Banshee seemed to be a good strategy here. Let me go ahead and get this mission over with so we can move on. Alright guys, I beat the mission. I did it. For sure. That was me. What else- who else was supposed to be here? I don't see anybody. Do you? No. Nobody's there. That's my dog. Why would my dog play StarCraft, you idiot? Let's go to Char now. Nothing's wrong here. Nothing at all. On the first Char mission, I had the very unique and balanced strategy of spamming hive mind emulators while maintaining a solid defense. Despite being the third to last mission in the entire game, the Zerg here is actually pretty tame. Even Zero Hour was worse, and that was the third mission. Do you know what you didn't have in Zero Hour? Siege tanks, battle cruisers, ultralisks, broodlords. All these badass units that will make this a cakewalk. I had to make sure to scour all the high ground, since this mission likes to spam a bunch of crawlers and tumors on various cliffs, so you couldn't just fly in with banshees and win instantly. Now you just have to do that with ghosts. God damn it, Blizzard. Also fun fact, Warfield can't die here. Despite all of Kerrigan's dramatic bullshit and Matt Horner going, We better mobilize everything to get to Warfield. Nothing happens if you kill all of his units. I guess he's just in a mild amount of discomfort. On the Char decision, just like basically every other run, I went with Belly of the Beast. I don't want the Nidus isn't all in, 
I actually want the air units and all in, and it's just a real easy hero mission. I don't think I have to elaborate further since it's just a base hero mission, so we're gonna go ahead and skip to all in. Now to state the obvious, I've already done this, well not including that one spore crawler, but I did want to go further in depth on how I beat this, because I've actually done this about half a dozen times. I think having a legion of mutalisks and broodlords, while simultaneously having an army of Terran units is pretty fun. This is actually my favorite way to beat this mission, so I'm going to get into it. The first thing you want to do is get extremely ahead economically. Your starting Terran force actually does a really good job at holding off the first few minutes, so I have plenty of time to get SCVs and Hivemind emulators up and running. Which, by the way, I'm going to abbreviate to HME because I'm not saying that every fucking time. You'll want to build most of your HMEs right by the artifact, but you also need a few behind your base, and it doesn't hurt to have a few by the left and right entrances. I think about 25 is where you want to get to, any more than 30 and you're going to have diminishing returns. When it comes to the units you want to control with your HMEs, Broodlords, Corruptors, Ultralisks, and Mutalisks are your main targets. The best time to move out towards a Hive is after Kerrigan dies between the 40-50% to 50 charge. I find the bottom right the easiest to kill first, since it doesn't have as much reinforcements, and once you kill the Hive, you can prioritize less defenses onto that side. The one thing that you need to know the most when you move out on the offensive is you need to prioritize killing the Hives. The Zerg's larva will always be morphing into something, so if you go into their base and don't expect a 150 supply of fuck you being hatched, you're going to have a bad time. The last thing you need to account for when you kill a hive is the occasional waves that respawn. On the southwest and northeast base, those waves are never too deadly, typically only being a few crawlers or a dozen units, but the northwestern base is a bit more tricky. Since all the air units spawn in this base, you're going to need to bring your anti-air units, and probably a lot of them. If you have all these entrances covered, and destroyed all the Zerg Hives, you don't really have to worry about much. Kerrigan will still spawn, but she's pretty easy to kill after you have a billion Broodlords. And if there are still a few Overlords or units around your base, you can use the Artifact's energy Nova to clear them out. And after that, after many hours of pure, unadulterated extinction, I finally beat StarCraft II Wings of Liberty as a God fucking damn it.